Tonight we're speaking on a subject which has nothing to do with the cults, but is the church and the blessed hope, the tribulation period, all of the materials connected with it. Let me, first of all, informally tell you why I'm speaking on it. I was asked to. That's number one. Number two, I don't generally lecture in this area because I consider this to be peripheral theology. What binds the body of Christ together is not when Jesus is coming again. What binds the body of Christ together is that he's coming again. And that we are supposed to be his witnesses until he arrives. We're to be bound together in Christian love. But the church and the tribulation is a very viable issue today in our Christian bookstores. Uh, fully a quarter of the material to a third of the material in publication and selling today has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. There's tremendous radio programs, television programs, a tremendous dedication to prophetic interpretation. And there is nothing wrong with this because the scripture speaks prophetically and we are to proclaim the word of the Lord. Nothing wrong with that at all. But there has developed tremendous conflicts in the body of Christ about the subject of the second coming of our Lord. And I think that what we ought to do is to have freedom to express ourselves without being penalized for our positions. And unfortunately, that's what's going on today. I was to speak in a large church in Southern California a while back, and uh, there were going to be about three to 4,000 people, it turned out there were, every night. And it was a great opportunity. The pastor of the church was very vigorously in favor of the pre-tribulation rapture. And he found out that I was a post-tribulationist. So word was sent to me that if I mentioned one word about the tribulation or the rapture, he would stop the meetings right there. And that would cancel the entire subject. Now, I don't know what frightens people so much about different points of view. The Apostle Paul says that there must needs be differences of opinions in your midst so that the truth may be made known. There is nothing wrong with having different opinions. And ministers, not only myself, but others, should not be penalized for taking what is in the minds of some an unpopular position. The church is supposed to operate on the thesis of love. And love is kind. Love is forbearing. Love is patient. Love does not boast nor seek its own position of authority. Love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, is supposed to govern the activities and the function of the members of the body of Christ. And when I see Christians fighting among themselves, about whether Jesus is coming before the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation, or after the tribulation. When I see books being published where statements are made, we are the generation that will see the second coming of Jesus Christ. When I see this type of thing going on, and bitterness developing, a root of bitterness developing among Christians, then I think it's time for us to air our differences of opinions. I think it's time for us to give the other guy a break. If you don't agree with him, love him or her for Christ's sake. But don't make that a point of division in the body of Christ. We must not be divided about whether we sprinkle, pour, or immerse, or whether we have wine, grape juice, or Coca-Cola at the communion service, which is what they do in Latin America anyhow. We shouldn't be arguing about pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation, and premillennial, amillennial, and postmillennial. The principal task of the church is to evangelize the lost world, and they couldn't care less. So, there have been all kinds of books written on this subject. Dr. John Valvord, a very famous writer from the pre-tribulation position, has written a book. There is such a deluge of information, we can't hope to cover all of the material. So what I elected to do this evening is something very simple. How many have your Bibles? Good. What I'd like to do is to tell you, first off, that the position I am going to set forth tonight is not new. 
That's number one. Secondly, the position I will set forth tonight was believed by the Christian Church for 19 centuries. The Church Fathers, the Reformers, every great theologian in the entire history of the church up until the last 140 years believed that we would see the Antichrist, that we would be persecuted by him, and that we would be delivered from him by the second coming of Jesus Christ. You will find this in Catholic theology. You will find it in Orthodox theology. You will find it in all of the Reformers. And you will not find the idea that we are going to escape the Antichrist until approximately 140 years ago when a 15-year-old girl had a revelation. And that revelation was picked up by J.N. Darby, the founder of the Plymouth Brethren, and developed into a form of theology known as dispensational theology. The church for 19 centuries never heard this doctrine, never believed it, and never preached it. If you want absolute proof of it, the simplest thing in the world is to go back and read Martin Luther, John Calvin, Melanchthon, Knox, all the Reformation thinkers. All of them believe that the papacy was the Antichrist. All of them believe we would be persecuted inevitably by Rome and by a great religio-economic military power with the number 666. They could hardly have been preaching that Jesus would come back before the tribulation if they were teaching that the Antichrist was already here. Therefore, what I'm saying is not heretical. What I am saying is not new. What I am saying, very simply, is let's consider the reasons why the church believed what she did. Now, it doesn't make it right because everybody believed it but it's a pretty good historical weight of evidence that ought to be considered. But the first thing to be considered is the Scripture. So in order to do that, the best place to begin is with the man who originated the entire thing, Jesus Christ. He is the one that spoke on his return to earth. If Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, Hal Lindsey can't. Hal and I are very good friends. We meet occasionally for debates. We uh, have vigorous, violent disagreements, and then we go out and have spaghetti uh, <laughs> and chat about other things and go on about our business because we recognize that differences of opinion are necessary in the church. But let's hold our differences of opinion in love. Let's not be threatened by each other and let's not major in the minors so that we spend all our time fighting about things that aren't worth fighting about. The thing that's worth fighting about is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, the Lord Jesus said, John chapter 14, If I go away, I will come again. I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Every one of us knows that text we learned in Sunday school. That was Christ's first utterance. I will come again. This became known in church history as the doctrine of the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in Titus chapter 2 amplified that slightly when he said, we are looking for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So the early church was looking forward in anticipation to Christ's ultimate return and the establishment of the eternal reign of righteousness on the earth. About that, there can be no doubt whatsoever. Now... What did Jesus actually teach about the second advent? That's the only way to get at the bottom line. And that's what all the church fathers looked at. That's what the reformers looked at. That's what all of the great theologians and thinkers in the history of the church looked at. The first question all of them asked was, what did Jesus say? 
What did Jesus actually teach about the second advent? That's the only way to get at the bottom line. And that's what all the church fathers looked at. That's what the reformers looked at. That's what all of the great theologians and thinkers in the history of the church looked at. The first question all of them asked was, what did Jesus say? And I want to go to Christ's statement on the subject because that's the clearest of all. In the 24th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ very specifically made some observations in response to a question that was asked him. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said, Do you not see all these things? I tell you that there shall not be left here one stone upon another which shall not be cast down. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Now notice the question, verse 3, very important. When will the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming? Anybody have any difficulty understanding the question? It's very direct and very simple. What is the sign of your coming? How will we know? Jesus answered, Take heed that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ. They shall deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in peculiar places. And these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. You shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many shall be offended. Many shall betray one another, and they shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he that endures to the end, the same will be delivered. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all of the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end be come. He set the perimeter. The gospel must be preached in all nations to all peoples. Then the end will come. When you therefore shall see the abomination that makes desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let them which in be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop don't even come down to take the things out of his home. Neither let him which is in the field go back to get his clothes. Woe unto them that are pregnant and those that are nursing children. Pray that your flight be not upon the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. You notice here in a Jewish context he's talking about the Sabbath day. Jews will be keeping the Sabbath just before the second coming of Christ. Now look at verse 21 carefully. For then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there is Christ, do not believe it. For there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets. They shall show great signs and miracles, inasmuch as if it were possible they would deceive the chosen. Behold, I told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, don't go. Behold, he's in the secret chamber, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wheresoever the carcasses are, there will the vultures be gathered. Now, look at verse 29. Follow the sequence. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, then shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. 
the stars shall fall from the heavens and the power of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven unto the other. Verse 36. But of that day and hour no man knows, not the angels of heaven, but my Father alone. He goes on to describe it as the days of Noah. Verse 37. He talks about two in the field, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore. Verse 42. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Verse 44, Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. Now, I have read this in context just so you would get the full impact of what he was saying. Jesus said, After the tribulation of those days, I will come again. He describes the wars, the rumors of wars, persecution, famine, all of the horrors that are the beginning. And then he says, now this is the key, verse 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination that desolates, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then flee. Ah, now we have some time frame. Jesus said, when you see the abomination that desolates in the temple, then you know that my return is near. What is the abomination that makes desolate? What is it that will sit in the temple? Well, since Jesus said it, let's follow him to his logical conclusion. He said, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Keep your finger in Matthew 24 and go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Gabriel gives a vision to Daniel, the 70 weeks, and he tells him the things that are going to happen. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be sixty-nine weeks and threescore and two weeks Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself and the people of the Prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with flood and the end of the war desolations are determined. Ah, what will happen? Messiah the Prince will come after 489 years from the command to rebuild Jerusalem. We now know from the discovery of the Elephantine papyri in Egypt and the calendar of the Jews that the time for the command to rebuild Jerusalem was the spring of 457 B.C. If you go from 457, 489 years, you will arrive at 27 A.D. And then you will arrive at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ three and one half years later. It is a time prophecy that came to fulfillment exactly. There is no other possibility of its interpretation. Now, we know, therefore, that Daniel's prophecy about the coming of Christ was accurate. What was to take place, according to Daniel, when Messiah came? Messiah will die, verse 26, but not for himself, but for the sins of the people. And the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city. In 70 A.D., Titus, the Roman emperor, besieged Jerusalem, surrounded the city, and the Christians remembered the words of the Lord Jesus. And they immediately departed from Jerusalem. As rapidly as possible, the Jews stayed there. Jerusalem fell. Titus took the Jews back to Rome into slavery. 
in 70 A.D., Titus, the Roman emperor, besieged Jerusalem, surrounded the city, and the Christians remembered the words of the Lord Jesus, and they immediately departed from Jerusalem. As rapidly as possible, the Jews stayed there. Jerusalem fell. Titus took the Jews back to Rome into slavery, took away their nation, destroyed the temple brick by brick, exactly as Christ had said in Matthew chapter 24, and left nothing of Jerusalem, raised it to the ground. Today, if you want to see the foundations of Jerusalem, you go 50 feet underground. That's where they are level to the ground, not one stone on top of another. He was the prince that came. He destroyed the city. He took the Jews captive. He won the war, and he punished them by exiling them from their land from 70 A.D. to 1948. At which time, the times of the Gentiles progressively began to end. And in Luke chapter 21, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be ended. They were ended in the Six-Day War, and the Jews have announced that they will themselves precipitate nuclear war before they will give back Israel to the Arabs. They have nuclear capability, and they can hit every Arab oil well within 30 minutes and nothing can stop them. If they do that, they cripple Western civilization because we are dependent upon oil. So the attention of the whole world returns once again to Israel. Now here we are looking at the words of the Lord Jesus. Not mine, not Lindsay's, not Valvord's, not anybody's. Christ's. When you see the abomination that desolates standing in the holy place, oh, then the next part of the prophecy has got to come to pass. Jerusalem has been destroyed. What is the next part of his prophecy? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. This is the prince that shall come. He shall confirm the covenant for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the offerings to cease. And for the overspreading of evil, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolator. Pre-tribulationists, mid-tribulationists, and post-tribulationists are all agreed that the person mentioned here is Antichrist. Everybody agrees it's Antichrist. So the abomination that makes desolate, that has to stand in the holy place, in the temple in Jerusalem, must be the man of sin. Now go back to the words of the Lord Jesus. When you shall see therefore, verse 15, the man of sin spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. That's the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Then flee. Because this is the tip-off. This is the circling vultures. The carcass is there. And the vultures are the signs of the times. And Christ's words carry absolutely lethal meaning because he has identified the abomination of desolation as Antichrist. He quotes Daniel to prove his point. And now, keeping your finger in Matthew 24, proceed to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to see if the Apostle Paul agreed with him. If he didn't, we're in serious trouble. Now we beseech you, brothers, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the context. The second coming of Christ. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. 
that you be not shaken in your mind or troubled neither by spirit, word, or letter purporting to come from us that the day of Christ is here. Let no one deceive you by any means for except the apostasy comes and the man of sin be revealed, the son of hell, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he, listen carefully, remember Daniel, remember Jesus, so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing that he is God. Remember when I was with you that I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining him that he might be revealed at this time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who nows will until the restraint is lifted he be taken out of the way. Then shall the wicked one, look at verse 8, then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall utterly destroy with the apiphania tes parousia. Ah, he even chooses two of the three words to describe the second coming of Christ and puts them together the outshining radiance of his presence. The Apostle Paul follows the Lord Jesus Christ line by line as Christ interprets Daniel and tells us that the church will not see deliverance until the man of sin is revealed, opposing everything that is God, sitting in the temple, working miracles with lies and wonders if it were possible to deceive the church. This is not my word. This is what the scripture itself says. Listen carefully. The wicked one shall be revealed, verse 8, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and ruin with the brightness of his coming. Him whose coming is after the power of Satan with all power signs and lying miracles and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that are perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be judged to believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This in church history is known as the Antichrist. We are warned about him in the book of Daniel. We are warned about him by the Lord Jesus. We are warned about him by the Apostle Paul. We are warned about him by the Apostle John. First John clearly tells us, it is the last times, little children, you have heard that Antichrist, singular, will come. Even now there are many antichrists, thereby we know it is the last times. Does John say, we're not going to be here when he arrives? No. He is saying, look out for him. Now think for a second. If you were an apostle writing a letter to the church, would you warn them about somebody that nobody was going to be here to see? I think not. I think if you were an intelligent apostle, you'd warn them about somebody they ought to look out for. Now, should we have any further misgivings in our mind what Christ and Paul said on the subject? I think it would be wise to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, which is very carefully avoided by people who do not like what Paul said there. Let us read it together. Verse 7, they're under persecution. To you who are troubled, rest with us. When is the rest going to come? What's the next word? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that do not know God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. When is the rest going to come? What's the next word? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that do not know God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. When is the church going to get rest? When the Lord Jesus comes in flaming fire to take vengeance on the world. This is a very important passage. Think of it for a moment. It says, when Jesus comes, the pressure goes off us. And at the same time that he comes, the pressure goes on the world. You cannot separate the verse. He will descend from heaven and in flaming fire. He will snatch us up in the twinkling of an eye as lightning goes from east to west. He will change these bodies of corruption that they be like unto his own glorious body. We shall meet him in that striking instant in the clouds and we shall descend to earth with him in the vengeance of God that will cleanse the earth and prepare for the millennial kingdom where we will reign with Christ for a thousand years. The church taught that for 1900 years. That is classic Christian theology. Rest for the church is when Christ comes to judge the world. Now, there is another very important point that must be made. I believe that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there is an extremely important passage very regularly neglected. So, into your Bibles, the 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and look at the passage. I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning them which are asleep or have died. Verse 13. That you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, those also who have died believing in Jesus, God will bring back with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend out of heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I want to take that phrase there, a very important phrase. The dead in Christ will rise first. Pre-tribulationists, mid-tribulationists, and post-tribulationists all agree this is the first resurrection. Nobody disagrees. When Jesus returns at that blinding instant, the saved will be resurrected. There's the passage. Now, if we can place the first resurrection, pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, will then be absolutely established. If we can place when it takes place. When does the first resurrection take place? Before the tribulation? In the middle of the tribulation? Or after the tribulation? That is the $64 million question. You ready for its answer? The 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, which is at the end of the line. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and bound him a thousand years. That tells you something, doesn't it? When did this take place? After the tribulation. 
The devil is not bound till after the tribulation. And the millennium doesn't begin till after the tribulation. So this is all after the tribulation. He shut him up that he should not deceive the nations for a thousand years. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That took place during the tribulation, when Antichrist beheaded the Christians, which had not worshipped the beast. The beast is in the tribulation. Neither his image, tribulation, neither received his mark, tribulation. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is after the tribulation. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. John places the first resurrection at the end of the tribulation and just before the millennium. Perfectly consistent with Paul, perfectly consistent with Christ, and perfect fulfillment of Daniel. I believe this is important for us to understand because we have been hearing only one view primarily for 140 years and it is not the historic view of the Christian church. I find it to be completely in disagreement with Matthew 24. It surely is in disagreement with 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. It will not stand up in Revelation chapter 20. And therefore, it should be rejected. Now, let me be careful here. If you want to be a pre-tribulationist or a mid-tribulationist, the Lord bless you. That's your decision, and I sure do hope you're right. Because the last person I want to see as Antichrist, I'm high on the list. <laughs> and there's a one bit of antagonism or rancor or bitterness or anger in my heart. I tell Lindsay every time we talk about this, I sure hope to heaven you're right. And he said, well, if I'm wrong, I'm coming looking for you. He said, by that time, he says, you should have it pretty well worked out what we're going to do. <laughs> I said, don't come looking for me, because as soon as I see the abomination that makes desolate, Walter is going to split. <laughs> that's what Jesus said, and that's common sense. <laughs> now... When Hal and I discuss things, I find that there are certain things common to pre-tribulationists after I present something like this. They say to me inevitably, but, Walter, you do not understand. Matthew chapter 24 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 are all talking about the tribulation saints, the church during the tribulation period. It's not talking about the church universal as it is today. These are the tribulation saints. That's the argument. Here is the answer. God is never illogical. Make a note of that. God is never illogical. He is sometimes illogical, which means he goes beyond logic. But he is never illogical. Because when you are illogical, you are not thinking straight. And God thinks straight. Now think about this for a moment. This is what I said to Hal. Hal, these are the tribulation saints? Right. I said, how do you know that they are the tribulation saints unless you have first assumed that the church is gone? And if you first assume that the church is gone, you are illogical because you are arguing in a circle. You are begging the question. It's illogical. And if it's illogical, it is not the mind of God. To which I received no response. Nobody will give any response to it because the argument itself 
cannot be refuted. If you arbitrarily make these people the tribulation saints, the only way that you can do it is to assume that your position is right. And you can't assume that your position is right. You have to prove your position. Proof and assumption are two different things. Circular reasoning is very dangerous. I remember once I was appearing on a radio program in New York and in this radio program, I had a group of hostile people who were jumping up and down on me with the proverbial golf shoes. And I had to give some consistent answers on the subject. And the man who was needling me was a former Mormon who had become an atheist professor at Barnard College in New York, next to Columbia University. So he couldn't wait to get his fangs into me the helpless fundamentalist. And he reached over and passed me a slip of paper. And the paper said, you are guilty of circular reasoning. Your argument is fallacious. It is illogical. God can't be illogical. And we were talking about the Bible. So I said to him, what do you mean I'm illogical and I'm wrong about the Bible? I said, the Bible is the word of God. He said, that's your wrong point, friend. He said, you are quoting the Bible to prove the Bible. And if you quote the Bible to prove the Bible, you are guilty of illogical thinking and you are arguing in a circle. And he smiled broadly and sat back and lit his pipe. As he did, I prayed. I had an answer, but I wanted one that the audience would get immediately. And the Lord gave it to me instantly in the form of a question. Who told him the Bible was one book? And I said, absolutely right. Never thought of that. And I looked across at him and I said, who told you the Bible was one book? He said, what? I said, who says the Bible is one book? He says, it is. I said, no, you are uninformed and ignorant about the Bible. I said, the Bible is a compilation of 66 books spanning a period of almost 4,000 years written by different people in different times, all of whom claiming an experience with the living God. And if I quote one of them to back up the other one, they are not in the same time frame and therefore I am not guilty of circular reasoning. But you see, this atheist had put his finger on one of the problems we have to face. Namely, God is not illogical. He's consistent. He thinks straight. And if you've got to assume a position to prove the position, that's illogical. And the position's not going to stand. Now, I have no quarrel with the people who hold the position. If they want to continue holding it, the Lord bless them. I would just like them to say the same thing to me. The Lord bless you, and you keep your position. And then stop fighting and discriminating in the body of Christ. The position I gave tonight is a very strong position. It's a very sound position in English, Greek, or Hebrew. It is sustained by all the great minds of the church for 19 centuries. And it's not heretical. It's plain common sense. You cannot invent stages of the first resurrection to get yourself out of your problems. You cannot make differentiations between Greek words in order to get your views across. You have got to go to the text itself and ask the question first, what did Jesus teach? What did Paul understand Jesus to teach? What did John understand him to teach? What did the church fathers understand them to say? What did the reformers and the Catholic theologians interpret it to mean? And after you get all of that evidence together, then you make a decision based upon the facts and not upon emotion. People who hold to the pre-tribulation position are pretty much psyched out by fear. 
that if Antichrist comes, they're going to be persecuted and they don't like it. Well, welcome to the club. Neither do I. So, if we are honestly to consider the second coming of Christ, let's consider it systematically. Jesus said, after the tribulation. Paul interpreted that way. He said, don't be troubled by the people who are telling you that the day of the Lord is come or gone because it's not going to take place until the man of sin is revealed. That ought to give us pause for prayer. John says the Antichrist will come. And the church historically interpreted exactly the way I have given it to you tonight. Now you're sitting there some of you with very deep convictions opposing my own. I once believed in the pre-tribulation rapture. So did Dr. Oswald Smith, one of Canada's greatest Bible teachers. And after 50 years in the ministry reading his Greek New Testament, Dr. Smith saw after the tribulation and connected it with the Apostle Paul and reversed his position after 50 years and wrote a beautiful pamphlet Tribulation or rapture? Which? They said he was senile. No. He was just willing to change a position he found would not stand up. If you want to hold a position, God bless you. If your pastor teaches you that position and he believes it, then what you should do if you have doubts is to take the scriptures to the pastor and put to the test what you have heard. If what I have said is not the truth, then I stand open to anybody's correction based upon the Word of God. But don't stuff it under the rug and bury it in your mind and conscience because you're afraid to face the Antichrist. That's an ignoble motive for holding on to a position. If you want to hang on to a position, hang on to it because it's scriptural, whether you like it or not. That's the reason for hanging on to a position. So you hang on to what position God leads you to. But I beg you, for Christ's sake, do not make this an issue of division in the body of Christ. Do not discriminate against your brothers and sisters who do not hold your position. Do not look down upon people because they honestly disagree with you. So you hang on to what position God leads you to. But I beg you, for Christ's sake, do not make this an issue of division in the body of Christ. Do not discriminate against your brothers and sisters who do not hold your position. Do not look down upon people because they honestly disagree with you. Rather, let, as the Apostle Paul says, there be differences of opinions in the church so that the Word of God, the truth of God, may be made known. If I'm wrong, and if the fathers are wrong, and if the reformers are wrong, and if the church was wrong for 1900 years, nobody will be happier than I am because I am not going to see Antichrist, and that will make me very, very happy. Chuck Smith, a dear friend of mine, was having lunch with me one time, and he said, Well, Walter, when the Lord comes, he said, I will wave to you on the way up and say, I told you so. <laughs> and I said, I will wave back and say, I am happier than you are. Because I was anticipating the Antichrist, and instead my theology and interpretation of it was an error. I hope it is, but I would implore you to take the scriptures and put to the test what you hear, no matter who it comes from. And my authority is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Test all things. Hold on tight to what's good looking for that blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall transform these bodies of our humiliation 
that they shall become like unto his own glorious body through that power whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For as by man came death, by man resurrection from the dead. In Adam all die, in Christ shall all be raised to life. 1 Corinthians 15 hammers on the resurrection of the body and connects it with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Christ and the first resurrection are synonymous and they are both described in Revelation chapter 20. The first resurrection is after the tribulation.